All right, there we are. We're finally on here. Uh, one of these fun days doing Off the Cuff with uh, technical difficulties and challenges, but we're finally going live here. Uh, I'm Joe Miller, co-host Leroy Hill is here. Hopefully we can actually hear him. We've been struggling with that uh, quite a bit, so we'll see if we can uh, do it. Leroy, can you hear us now? Oh. No, we're not here, but we'll see. Well, hopefully Leroy will join in. Otherwise, he'll just be a pretty face on the screen while we have a conversation, uh, and we'll see if that works out. But hey, today we're going to look at uh, Craig, William Lane Craig's book, uh, In Quest of the Historical Atom, and we've got a couple uh, guests with us today, uh, some guys who have done work in this area, have done some analysis of Craig's book, and have also... Uh, in the case uh, of John Oswald, has spent quite a bit of his career looking into Old Testament uh, and and done a lot of studies in that. So, uh, Mike, John, it's good to have you guys with us. Uh, I'll have you guys Thank do you. like a little, yeah. It's uh, I'll have you guys just do a little preface here, but I'll just say this. So, um, Mike, we'll start with you uh, since you're at the top of my screen. And uh, so, you know, I mean, tell folks a little bit about what, what in your background uh, m- makes this topic of interest to you? Uh, what what kind of has, has sparked your interest and in why you care about this topic of historical Adam? Sure, Joe. Well, like uh, Bill Craig, I do philosophy of science and uh, history, uh, particularly history of science. And... Um, my interest in history of science is focused on the relation between science and religion, which um, Bill Craig's book is principally about, how you harmonize the findings of uh, theology with those of science. So, uh, and then as a philosopher of science, I've uh, paid a lot of attention to what are the traits of a theory that indicate likely truth. and. Uh, so uh, coherence and non ad hocness and a number of other traits. There's about 12 major traits. And uh, whether they're historical theories, theories about what has happened in the history of humanity or the history of the universe, they all have certain traits that indicate like the truth. So uh, analyzing these things is very important to me. And I apply this also in Christian apologetics. So a lot of overlap between uh, what Bill has done in his career and um, how I focus my yeah, and so you know, folks just understand. You know, uh, you know, for Craig in this book, he's he's not he's not a scientist per se. He's not even an Old Testament scholar per se. But he's 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 a philosopher of science, as you talked about, as a theologian. And so, very similar, uh, you know, overlap between your background and his in, in that sense. So that's that's kind of useful in the analysis here. So, John, what about you? Uh, what's what's in your background that makes this topic uh, so interesting to you? I did my doctoral degree with Cyrus Gordon at Brandeis University, and his conviction, which I think is right, is that you cannot understand the Bible correctly unless you understand it in its ancient Near Eastern context. And so my whole degree was focused in that area, and my thinking since then has been largely along those lines, leading to ultimately a few years ago writing a book called the Bible among the myths. And my deep conviction is that the one of the unique aspects of biblical revelation is that God reveals himself in the context of history. And um, if there are parts of the Bible that in fact are separated from God's activity in history, I think we then have disconnected the theology from the reality. And so uh, that's that's been very significant for me in thinking about the connection of the Bible and history. Yeah, it's good. And uh, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll give a little shout out to the book later as well, The Bible Among Myths, but it was a, it's, a, it's an excellent book. I've tried to refer a lot of people to it over the years uh, when they're trying to understand, you know, ancient Near East uh, kind of context for the Old Testament, so it's 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 a good piece. And uh, full disclosure, John was uh, he was one of my readers for my Master of Arts in Science and Religion, my thesis that I did. So um, and I passed, so apparently it wasn't you know too bad. So uh, but so I've uh, been familiar with this myself for a long time. But Leroy, 
Hopefully we'll get a chance here. Leroy's finishing his THM and intertextual studies. And so a lot of the issues that, that come up in Craig's book are related to some of his uh, uh, thesis that he's been working on in this. But Leroy, can you give a little uh, connection here for you, but also hopefully uh, just a little summary of what Craig's book is about, just for those who may not have read it, had a chance to look at it. Oh, and Leroy is not going to do that. We cannot hear you, Leroy. Well, I will give the summary anyway, and Leroy will just have to try to join us in a minute. But so for those those that aren't familiar, um, the book that Craig has is broken into two parts. There's uh, the first half, roughly, uh, is dealing with the hermeneutics of the Old Testament and how do you understand the the literature of the Old Testament. And so it's it's dealing really with the, the text itself. The second half of the book is dealing with uh, basically some scientific findings that Craig, and he's very selective, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but he's selective because Craig's premise ultimately is he's trying to reconcile the biblical story of Adam and Eve with the uh, the consensus science uh, view of universal common descent and animal to human evolution. So his goal is to try to reconcile those two things. So he really spends the second half of the book looking um, at, at at different scientists and and papers and research that affirm that and trying to say, okay, is there is there an avenue that we can accept universal common descent? And, and reconcile a historical Adam in some degree. So that's the, the rough summary of his book. Leroy would have done a much better job, but since his audio is not here, you know, we just have to have me do it. So that's too bad. Um, so that's, that's a real quick thumbnail sketch. So John and Mike, um, what do you think the overall goal, what, in your mind, what was Craig, Craig's overall goal? What was he trying to accomplish with this book and who's the audience he's trying to reach? Well, I think uh, Craig would like to be of service to the church and to Christian apologetics so that um, if you're talking with someone who doesn't believe the Bible but believes in uh, the consensus view of human evolution, um, Craig's approach would help to at least bracket temporarily um, the Bible in regard to human origins and just say, uh, let's look at, let's say, arguments for the resurrection and the moral argument and so and other sorts of arguments because there are certain theologians and you know, interdisciplinary stuff like Craig who think that you can harmonize the consensus view of science uh, with mm -hmm. uh, the Bible. Of course, there's huge problems with the consensus view of science, but that's a whole other topic beyond beyond our conversation today, I would <laughs> guide readers to, to discovery.org to look at the scientific criticisms, but that's really not our, our place here today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here. And but so Craig does, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, um, <laughs> so I, I did have Casey Luskin uh, on, uh, and we actually, he actually showed up to my house. Uh, he was down from Seattle. He was in San Diego. And we did a whole hour show on the science part of the book. So right. to that, if folks want to get that, um, morethancake.org forward slash off the cuff, you can kind of see the archive of what I did with there with Casey. It's on YouTube as well. Um, and, and so we're, yeah, so you're right that we're not really going to dive into that part so much today because that's not the field for the, for, you know, those of us here, but, but just to let people know that if they want that, we yeah. I, I've done that in the past as well. Good. Yeah. My sense is that, um, Craig is, is driven by the second Adam in Paul. Uh, he has to, to make that argument work in Paul, there has to have been his, an historical Adam. I think at the same time, he looks at Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and says, boy, uh, there's no way we can make that agree with the scientific consensus. So somehow I have to keep a historical Adam and the scientific consensus at the same time. And it seems to me 
Genesis 1, 2, and 3 suffer in the case and the result of that. Yeah. 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 Who do you think he's trying to re- – I mean, is he trying to persuade Christians to um, embrace – the science or is he trying to embrace secular scientists? Cause I know Mike, you mentioned like even, you know, apologetic kind of thing, but isn't it apologetic for Christians? Like, Hey, you Christians can believe science or is this apologetic at the non-believer who he's trying to convince the, to read the Bible? What, what do you think? Who's he really trying to reach there? Who's he trying to convince? Well, I think both audiences are in his view because as mm-hmm. I mentioned for, for an unbeliever, uh, Craig's book might help them to at least bracket temporarily the, the, the evolution question and, and then take a look at the Bible with the, the idea that at least some Christians think it's compatible with Darwinian evolution or a theistic version of it. Um, so, but, but he also is trying to appeal to Christians uh, to um, give them a way to look at the Bible that doesn't seem to be in conflict with consensus science. Uh, but I think there's cost to that, which we'll, of course, get to. Yeah, yeah, we'll unpack it. John, anything to add to that? or? No, I, I, think, okay. I think that's right. I, it's, it's hard to get into somebody else's head as to exactly yeah. where he was aiming, but I, I, I would assume that he has an interest in both audiences. Yeah, yeah, I guess so, too. I, I think so, too. I, I kind of think his real goal is to <coughs> – there's so many young Christians who are – uh, stepping away from faith because they're persuaded that science disproves the reliability of the scripture. So I, I think, I think part of the goal, uh, I, I think a large part of it is trying to persuade Christians. You can still believe what you want to believe and not be intimidated by the science. I think that's the, I, I think that's his main goal, but, um, I'm sure he, you know, wouldn't mind persuading, you know, people who are agnostic or atheist that they can, still come to the Bible and that they don't have to give up their beliefs either in, in the science side of things. I, I guess there's probably too full there, but um, all right. So I, you know, with that sort of uh, overview in mind, I want us to unpack two different aspects of Craig's book. Um, the, what he calls really mytho history uh, and that uh, uh, genre that he kind of comes up with. And uh, then also Craig's belief about the historical versus the textual Adam. And we'll, we'll unpack for folks what that means later when we get to that to those questions, the historical versus textual Adam. But right now, let's look at mytho-history. And, and by the way, so folks, I might sometimes call it mytho-hermeneutic. Uh, that's my short change of, uh, you know, saying like he's using this idea of genre of mytho-history to, inter- to interpret the text. So therefore, it makes it a hermeneutical uh, device or hermeneutical tool. So sometimes I call it a mytho-hermeneutic, just kind of shortchange it. I'm sure it'll catch on. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so here's the question, though. Um, Craig's book seems to have, uh, you know, in my view, it seems to create a little bit more confusion than clarity on the subject of myth itself. So before we look at really the substance of this claim about Genesis 1 through 11, which Craig says is mytho history. Let me ask this: uh, what What is a myth, and what is mytho history? And John, I'm going to have you jump in first because this relates to a lot of your book, The Bible Among My- the Myths, uh, and, and and we also did a written interview uh, about this a while back. So tell us what myth is and what is mytho history. One of the characters in Alice Through the Looking Glass says. A word means whatever I want it to mean. And that's exactly the case with myth. Uh, From the origin of the word, the Greek word, it is a false legend of the gods. And that, of course, is the meaning that the person on the street uses. If I say the resurrection is a myth, bingo, they know I do not believe the resurrection ever occurred, and I believe that it is a false legend. Well, sociologists don't like that. <laughs> that. That's a value judgment, and you mustn't do that. Uh, so it's been sort of reduced to it's a story about the gods. And uh, I've seen various writers who would call themselves evangelical who say, well, yeah, the Bible is a myth. It's a story about the gods. Mm-hmm. But the sociologists are generally going to say, no, it is a legend which the users consider to be true. And true, of course, is not factual, but it is 
something that is essential, something that is important to life, so that it becomes very, very difficult to pin down what a person means when they say this is mythical. It's very interesting. I can say the resurrection is a myth. And somebody says, oh, you don't believe in it. You don't think it's true. And I say, oh, no, it's profoundly true. You mean it happened? Of course not. But it's true. Uh-oh. Yeah, John is home, by the way, today. So this is one of our other fun technical things today. He uh, having snowstorms at his home, so he couldn't go into his <laughs> office. So he's gotten that. So I... I believe in John. I'm Oswald. back on, I think. <laughs> oh, I was just trying to say, I, I thought John Oswald was a myth, but now he's, <laughs> he's, he's not. He's really yes. here. Yes. True that yes. He's here. All right, so jump back in uh, here and explain it. So then when we talk, and, and I think it is the German scholar Torkel Jakobsen who used the idea of mytho history. And basically what he meant by that was, here is a false legend which is garbed in the form of history. He does not believe these things happen. He didn't use it to talk about Genesis 1 to 11 necessarily. He simply used it to talk about a category of myths. And uh, Craig has picked it up, but uh, uh, I think Craig needs to know when he's talking about genre that the originator of this language certainly does not believe that any of this stuff has any historical validity. Hmm. Mike, what's your thoughts on that? Myth, mytho history? Right. Well, I've been reading quite a bit of Torquil Jakobsen in the last month. <clears throat> I'm currently close to UC Berkeley Library where we're living in, so it's been a great um, resource for me. But um, I would agree with John that uh, Jakobsen, um, when he coined this term myth of history, um, he was uh, primarily had in view the uh, Sumerian myth uh, that had some historical trappings or um, kind of historical feel to it because of its, uh, particularly its genealogical content um, and, and also the way the myth sort of moved along by its timeline with cause and effect, it kind of had more, a little bit of a feel of history, but it also had more traditional traits of myth, so he, he coined the term myth of history. But I agree with John that Jakobson uh, did think that that the gods really existed, and I think Craig acknowledges that too in his book, but I think that um, to use the term the way he does uh, it is very problematic, um, even if, I mean, he says, well, I don't mean what popularly is meant by myth, but even professional uh, folks in many different disciplines, um, beyond just the folklorists, um, will, yes. will have various uh, views of what myth is, and the, most of them will think of this as um, not actually reflecting mm -hmm. reality, but uh, they but it expresses something that was considered to be, quote, true by the pe people that, that concocted the myth or that perpetuate the myth. But this is more, as Don was saying, in a sociological sense, it's just uh, true for them. But, it's, but yes. the, the expert studying this doesn't really think it's true. So it's, it's, a, it's a tangle of words and concepts here. It's very difficult to, to tease this all out. Yes. So in some and, degree... And Oh, I was just going to ask John, I want you to yep. jump in, but let me ask the question this way. So to some degree, it sounds like Jakobsen has the opposite definition of what Craig, even you know, what Craig does, even though he's using the same word. Jakobsen, Jakobsen think, would say that uses historical elements, but the underlying story is not true. Craig seems to say it has historical elements, but the underlying part is still true. seems like that, that would be saying that, that very different I think things, that's exactly right. right. I think... I think this is a, a good example of a category error. Uh, he ha is using it in a way other than the originator of the term meant. And, and the impact, the impact for the reader on the street is to say, oh, Genesis 1 to 11 is a myth with historical overlays on it. 
None of this stuff ever happened. God did not act in history in these ways. That's the that's where the reader on the street is going to take this, I guarantee. Yeah. Leroy, let's see if we can hear you yet. You going to jump in here? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Trust me, guys. Leroy is actually a pretty smart guy. He doesn't look it, but, um, <laughs> but he's actually a pretty brilliant guy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, most people see, I mean, they see a beautiful man like Leroy and they say, oh, he can't have any brains, but, but clearly he does. It's just, you wouldn't guess that, you know, because of his just outward beauty, you think, oh, I can't have it, but, but he does. So trust me, you're, you're missing out on some deep insights, uh, from Leroy. So, uh, Leroy, man, this is really sad. So, cause Leroy and I have talked about this thing thousands of hours of I just we spent countless hours talking about this stuff so uh and I know it relates to a lot of his work so I was looking forward to his interaction here but hopefully yeah. I don't know what's on with his phone but uh we'll see all right well yeah. let me just transition then so with that with that understanding um uh, of myth and mytho history so Craig did an interview with a gal named Melissa Kane Travis. Uh, she's a professor at Houston Baptist University, where Craig is also uh, a faculty member there. Uh, and it was a, it was in the November issue of the Worldview Bulletin. I don't know if either of you guys saw that, but um, but I, it's really not important that you, you read. It. I want to quote a little some of his answers, and, I, and I'm only using this interview because I think. Craig reinforces exactly what he says in the book. There's not much different than in the book. It's just that the interviews, I think, are a little more accessible for some people to understand some of the concepts. So I'm just going to use his phrasing from this interview uh, because I think it reinforces, again, what he wrote in the book. It's not a contradiction. Uh, it's just a little more understandable to some people that maybe all this is new. So, uh, so here's what she says. Uh, she asked Craig this question. Uh, she says, quote, uh, you accept the biological common descent of homo genus. Why do you view this as a better explanation than the de novo or from scratch creation of Adam? Where does the human soul fit into this practice? And that was her question. Now, Craig's answer uh, is this. He said, first of all, it is very important to understand that in this book, I am not concerned with how man came about, but rather when man first, when man first came about. The process by which man appeared on the scene is not important to me. You're quite right in saying that I accept for the sake of the argument, common descent. That is to say, I assume it, but that isn't to say that I defend it or propound it. So this is interesting to me because, I mean, it seems like an actually an odd way to, to say that because it seems like the book is, is concerned about, you know, the, how man came about when you accept you know, the evolutionary ex explanation of animal to human evolution. So it seems like that is primarily what it's about, but so I don't fully understand that. But my first response, so, you know, my other response was that Craig's answer to Travis makes clear that uh, animal to human evolution is at least for the sake of the argument. Uh, it's his first, it's his primary presupposition going into writing of this book. He's like, look, evolution as far as animal to human evolution must be true there's this universal common ancestry with man and in the pre-hominids the pre-human hominids that were around you know were related to the great apes through some common ancestry that sort of whole narrative he's saying is is true he's accepting it as true and that presupposition drives the need for his mytho hermeneutic right so he's saying how yes. can i reinterpret the bible let me accept that as true and what do i need to do so that i can still accept um some sort of historical adam uh in some part because he, he does acknowledge that's that's necessary um so before i get into we're going to break this down into th some three smaller parts of how he develops this mytho hermeneutic but let me just ask you guys this just with that interview and that sort of setup uh, what thoughts you have regarding, I don't know, the quotes from the interview um, or animal human evolution, how that plays out? Again, we're not getting into the science here for folks interested. I'm just curious how you see that playing out in his hermeneutical uh, proposition that he's offering here. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, Craig does explicitly say he, he attempts to look at the biblical data and ancient Near Eastern background, apart from any contemporary scientific concerns. Um, but uh, as he, as he uh, discussed with Sean Dow in another interview, of course, in the background of his mind, he has th this, um, this assumption that he'd like to play with of human evolution. 
but it, he's trying to come to the biblical text and looking at it um, without uh, any distortions from contemporary science. So I, I believe that's what he's attempting to do. I guess the question is how successfully is that doing it? Yeah. John, any thoughts? Yeah, I, my reading says that, that he is attempting to conform the scriptural text to his assumptions about how humans have developed. And since it doesn't conform very well, therefore, you've got to say, uh, this, is, this is not, in fact, as it is presented in the text, genuinely historical. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's the odd part about his book that, um, you know, he'll say, no, no, I, I, I arrive at these two things independently. You know, I, um, you know, my hermeneutic is independent of my acceptance for the sake of the argument that he keeps pointing out uh, of common ancestry. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me that, that they are independent. It seems to me that's the driving force behind it. In, in his interviews he's done on this, it's been pretty clear that like he struggled, he agonized over it. He's like, he said, he's clear in the McGall interview, I think you mentioned there, Mike, uh, he struggled over it. He agonized over writing this book. Well, why did he agonize? Because he knew that he needed a, he knew that as the text was written on it, as it's been understood for several thousand years, uh, was not going to mesh with his commitment to, um, universal common ancestry. So he agonized because he, he didn't want to give up the consensus science and he didn't want to give up historical atoms. So I don't know. I, I, I struggle with the idea that he arrived at this purely independently of the commitment to common ancestry, uh, his mytho history. And it seems like that a priori assumption of common ancestry was the only reason to delve into this. I don't know. Uh, that may be going beyond what we all know, but that's just my take. I don't know. Um, yeah, but, but regardless of that, we just need to evaluate the strength and weakness of this thesis. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's look at that then. Let's, let's, there's three really three parts to Craig's model of his hermeneutic, his mytho hermeneutic. Um, and the first one uh, depends on the assertion that Genesis 1 through 11 cannot be understood outside the cultural context of the ancient Near East. And the mythology of the ancient gods, such as the Mesopotamian gods and the Egyptian deities, which he gets unpacks in the book, um, you know, this gives us the framework to understand what is really happening in Genesis one through eleven. So, for you guys, and I know we, I know John, you brought this up a little bit at the beginning in the intro, but based on your own study of the Old Testament, what is the proper relationship for ancient Near East culture, ancient Near East religion, mythology? What's the proper context for using that to understand Genesis? And does Craig get it right as he as he explains that relationship in the book? Well, I'm I'm very concerned about the number of authors today who are basically saying we have totally misunderstood the Old Testament because we didn't understand its ancient Near Eastern background. I, I see Michael Heiser doing this, I see John Walton doing this, I see others doing that same thing, which says to the average person on the street, uh, I'm sorry, you can't read the Old Testament. You won't understand it. You've got to have a PhD in ancient Near Eastern studies before you understand it. I <laughs> violently disagree with that. The Bible is perspicacious. That, that's an old doctrine. The, the Bible does indeed interpret itself and you can read it as a child and get the essential points out of it. That being said, uh, one of the courses that I've taught over the years is having students read the Bible and ancient Near Eastern literature together. And what always emerges is, oh my goodness, these are two different animals. Yeah, there are similarities, but it's not the similarities that define them. It's the differences that define them. And when you really look at that, um, in again, sorry for the reference, but in my book, I've got about 15 things where the myths and the Bible are diametrically opposite. And so uh, I would say that once again, when you read Genesis 1 to 11 and the myths, 
you recognize you're dealing with a different genre. Something is not the same here. And I think, I think Craig has obscured that very unfortunately. Mm. Mike, yeah, thoughts? I have a point that's very closely related to that. It's a quote from Torquil Jacobson about the changeability or malleability of, of myth, which is a big point in Craig's book, which he uses as an argument for metaphorical uh, figurative interpretation, is that uh, myths are inherently protean or changeable. Um, so here's the quote, and, it, and then I'll relate it to what John just said. Jakobsen writes, it follows from this, I should think, that one ought to be extremely cautious when one seeks to interpret a myth, for myths are protean, that is, that is, they're changeable. They have no single constant meaning. They change their spots, always in flux, according to place and time. So while it is always tempting and often correct to see myths of origin as normative and as charters, one need only contrast Genesis on new created man and God saw everything that he was made, that he made and behold it was very good. Contrast that with the wretched creature on which Nintur takes pity in the Sumerian tale to realize that the meaning of myth is relative and changeable and that accordingly and regrettably all easy generalization perforce is out. So when Yahweh <laughs> talks about the changeability of myth, He's thinking of myth of origins. It's it's changed in one way in Genesis. It's changed in another way in the Sumerian culture, and uh, of course, uh, Craig couldn't accept that degree of changeability. But that's the kind of, of change uh, changeability that Jacobson folds in his view of myth, including his myth of history view. And so, uh, John, I think you're right that here even Jacobson is pointing out a huge difference, isn't he? And yet, yes, Craig yes, wants to use Jacobson to uh, to justify this myth of history genre identification without paying attention, I think, to some of the details of what Jacobson actually does with this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the that's that's pretty clear in Craig's book too. He's he he never gives a definition of myth or mytho history. Really, he just says there's ten. Uh, qualities of mytho history, but he resists actually giving a definition. And maybe it's because he's relying on that Jakobson's kind of idea that it's so malleable that you don't, if you give a definition, you'll, you'll eventually, <laughs> you know, miss the mark on what it even is, which I, I just find problematic because I know John in your book, which, um, you know, you're, you're very clear on a definition for what myth is. Um, and, and I think that that is way more, useful to the student of the Bible, but also the student of the ancient Near East to understand what it is we're actually doing without this sort of subjective uh, qualities criteria that make it very difficult. And, and, I, and, I, and I share that concern, I think, ultimately, that um, I think, you know, we, I don't know anybody who really doesn't value the use of ancient Near East you know, stories and civilization in, in giving sure. uh, color and flavor to, to the Old Testament. Uh, but that's very different than saying that if you're not an ancient Near East scholar, you really don't even have the right understanding. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, we kind of, Craig makes that leap uh, mm -hmm. in this, this book a little bit, which is a little disconcerting. And I, and I, uh, yeah. I find that problematic for sure. Um, Leroy, are we still, are we still have no voice for you, right? You're looking good. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. This is so funny. All right. Well, Hey, um, okay. Well, well, let's look at the second, uh, sort of leg of Craig's stool for mytho history, his mytho hermeneutic. So the, the second stool of that leg, this three legged stool is to, uh, as he builds this myth of hermeneutic is Craig embraces an, un, an un, really an unspecified formulation of the Valhausen documentary hypothesis, which he claims all Old Testament scholars use to some degree or another. Uh, so uh, do you guys, do you find his use of the documentary hypothesis useful for interpreting Genesis? Uh, and, and what are your thoughts on that, um, his use of that? Yeah, I think he actually well, makes a use, and he, and he does criticize it, 
But he does think that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are two different stories that uh, have apparent conflicts that um, the editor didn't seem to mind as he was stitching the two sources together. Um, whereas I think there's a better argument that <clears throat> Genesis 2 <clears throat> is a expansion of the six days of creation. And I, I think these days are analogical days, not literal days. I'm, I'm following uh, Jack Collins here on that. But that, that, that the, the second st uh, story of creation is an expansion of the first. And there really aren't any conflicts between the two. Whereas Craig, Precisely. because his myth of history hermeneutic, as you call it, is set up to look for contradictions and then say, yes. see, this is evidence that it's not to be taken literally. Yes. Um, and then, yes. whereas uh, Collins, Jack Collins, um, in his book, Reading Genesis Well, he's not, he's not um, geared or focused on trying to find contradictions and therefore say, we have to interpret metaphorically, but he's looking at a detailed textual analysis and looking at multiple axes of language use, not just a one-dimensional genre analysis and then make that do all the work. Craig presses his mental history genre analysis that did way too much work. And there are other old times right. than the scholars that have big problems with this. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, uh, again, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for conflict, you can find it. <laughs> if you're looking for a, a harmony, you can find that. And this is the point that I would make that and I, I fully agree with what Mike is saying here, that chapter two is now picking up on the point that chapter one makes, that the apex of this whole thing is humanity. Chapter two now is looking at the place of humanity in creation and the relationship of God to creation, and it's setting the stage for chapter three. And so it's chapter two is has a different function than chapter one and that's the reason for the difference now with yeah. regard to the documentary hypothesis uh, it's it's very much like myth if you want to be an accepted old testament scholar in the guild you say i agree with the documentary hypothesis once you've done that then you can deny every aspect of it or change yeah. every aspect of it. It's talk about malleable myths. <laughs> the documentary hypothesis yeah. is one of the most malleable <laughs> that you can find. And so, uh, so again, I would say that yeah. the, to, to build an argument on that is, is very, very risky. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the and odd John, part. Be, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, John, one of the traits of a likely true theory is its simplicity as opposed to complexity. And as you know, documentary hypothesis is an unwieldy, mainly <laughs> complex <laughs> of, of hypotheses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's amazing. They, uh, oh, yes, I accept that the D document was written in 621, and then you talk about all the ways in which the D document, Deuteronomy, has this long prehistory. Well, when was it written anyhow? Well, 621, of course. Yeah, yeah, Craig seems to do, it's weird. It's like he doesn't really give much space to it. He just says, I have to accept this. It's, it's key to my mytho hermeneutic. Um, but again, he never really defines, he just says some version of it, some iteration of it yep. has to be used. Yep. But he doesn't yep. say what iteration or what version of that, which, you know, no. in my it's sort of a little red flag when you're reading. If somebody says, I accept some version of this, but they don't tell you which version or they don't give details. I just I don't know. I, it just yep. seems odd to me. Um, it's it's like, yeah, I just have to accept it's true. And I'm not even going to tell you the framework I'm using or which version of it. I, I don't know. I, I, just, I found it. One of the part things of the that. One of the things that worries me is his tendency to say all, all Old Testament yeah. scholars accept the document, all Old Testament scholars accept the idea that Genesis 1 to 11 is myth of history. Uh, that, that, it seems to me, is in debating. <laughs> That's a place where immediately you set yourself up for a weakness. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's that no, struck he, me too as well. Yeah, he, he will say that um, there are, um, of course, diversity of opinions about how to interpret this passage among experts. And But he wants to pull more experts over into his um, frame of mind of, of labeling it in Nephi history. And he claims that some of these experts basically are there, but don't want to use the term because it will be misunderstood. But as I dialogue uh, and read the sources myself and dialogue with the actual people, such as Jack Collins, I'm finding that there are some major differences there, and they're not as close to Craig's view as he, he would like them to be. Yeah. Now, Mike, I know you asked that question that, you know, that we were discussing there. You asked a question about that at the ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society, had the big thing back in November, and Craig's had a, there's a panel, and you asked that question. Because he does sort of say, well, these these scholars, X, Y, Z, these guys, they really accept mytho-history. They just don't have the, they just don't have the guts to say it, essentially. He's kind of calling guys out, saying they just don't have... They just don't have the will or the desire to admit it because it would be too much blowback, which seems like an awful odd like assertion to assume the 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 mental state of these scholars. Um, you know, uh, just that. Uh, of course, they they all agree with me. They just want to admit it. Kind of it just seems like an odd framing of the debate. But I know you asked that question um, at the thing, and how was that handled? By the way. Yeah, well, uh, Craig did publicly apologize to uh, to Jack Collins for uh, being uncharitable toward him in that regard, uh, because he made sort of an uncharitable interpretation of, of Collins' um, approach and, and view. Um, but uh, as I continue to dialogue with Collins, it's clear that there are some some significant differences between their views, and that and that Collins yeah. thinks that his his approach does not conceal anything, but rather it's uh, it's use multiple axes of language use to analyze the text, uh, uh, and you not have a blanket, you know, hermeneutic of oh, it's this genre, therefore you interpret it. The text is almost all figurative, therefore. That, that's that's just yeah. too quick and easy, and and that's not. A, a, I think the more multi-axis approach, multi-dimensional approach of Collins and other. Old Testament scholars like Gordon Wenham are superior in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so let's look at the third leg of Craig's stool on his mytho, uh, you know, his mytho history, his mytho hermeneutic. Uh, and that's, he believes, that the modern discipline of genre analysis, which we've kind of covered a little bit. So, you know, maybe we've covered this a little bit, but I just want to kind of hone in on it. So that the genre, genre analysis offers scholars the necessary interpretive tools to understand Genesis as myth mytho history uh, on its face and this goes back to what you said earlier john you know it seems to undermine two thousand years of christian tradition since none of these people had access to the tools and the kind of genre analysis craig considers fundamental to interpreting genesis so kind of what he does with ancient near east mythology you have to be an ancient near east scholar you also have to sort of be an ancient you know you have to be a, a genre phd to, or else you just don't have any because if it's fundamental you know, like if you cannot understand genesis without knowing this genre and it's a genre that he just come up with now that means nobody before this book really understood genesis that seems like a pretty i mean am i overreading that is that really what he's saying uh i mean maybe he didn't try to say it but it just seems like that's what he's saying and it's a little little off-putting <laughs> yeah i i think I think you're right, and, and as, as I said earlier, Genesis one to eleven is not the genre of myth. If if you read if you read those things which have across the centuries been understood to be myth, Genesis one is not the same. Now, if you say, and and, and here I'm here I'm going to at least partially agree with him. If you say that the way in which the historical data is developed in Genesis 1 to 11 is somewhat different from the way it's developed later, I'll agree with that. Mm -hmm. But to thereby say, well, then that immediately moves it from the genre of history into the genre of myth. Yeah. And so he's forced to create this new genre of mytho history which, as Mike has, has so well shown, uh, Jakobsen himself does not think of Genesis 
in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, so it is to say that Genesis one to eleven is of the genre of myth. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any thoughts, Mike? Well, um, I think that Craig would say that um, people have understood Genesis to a degree uh, correctly through the ages, but that uh, in, as we have access, have had become uh, knowledgeable of other um, modes of analysis and skills and uh, archaeological evidence and so on, that we that our interpretation can be fine tuned. Um, now, I, in some ways, I want to say that sure. Jack Collins' approach in reading Genesis well takes into account the kind of discourse analysis that, let's say, the Wycliffe Bible translators use and uses uh, a lot of um, really interesting perspectives from linguistics and so on. Uh, and so it's not like uh, I mean, these new approaches Collins shows uh, helps to, uh, on a case by case basis, as you're looking through the text to find where the author probably more intended a figurative um, picture here or a pictorial representation mm -hmm. where it was more straightforward. Um, and so it's not a blanket uh, sort of, hey, it's myth of history, therefore it's all, all or mostly figurative. Mm -hmm. Craig approaches it. So I think that these more recent techniques can enrich what many people certainly have kind of intuitively known you know, like uh, he, he talks about even cs lewis's approach he didn't cs lewis didn't know a lot of the most recent approaches in linguistics and discourse analysis but still came to similar conclusions mm -hmm. uh, just by uh, being a very careful reader of the text and being a very careful historian and, and someone who, who knew both mythology and, and serious religion uh, in, in the biblical sense. Uh, so I think that more recent techniques can make more precise and um, our, our hermeneutics, but it doesn't overturn massively uh, centuries of biblical interpretation. So I, that's the way I would put it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. You know, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and look at Adam. Uh, because I think I think when we look at what Craig does with the historical versus the textual Adam, um, it kind of gives us some practical examples, a little bit of some of what we've been talking about, some very specifics. So uh, folks need to understand, you know, that what Craig says is there is a, I mean, this is the part I agree with his book, and I'll have a quote in a little bit here that, you know, he, he is convinced that there has to be a historical Adam who is somehow the, what he uses the word fountainhead of all humanity. I'm not sure what that word means, uh, to be honest, in the tag, in his book. Um, but um, he seems to give some conflicting definitions, to be honest. But, but he says he's the fountainhead. He, there's a, there has to be this historical Adam. But the historical Adam isn't what we necessarily read in the text of the Bible. So there's a, there's a Bible, there's an Adam in the text and there's an Adam of history. And those two are distinct in his view. So regarding Craig's historical Adam, um, he said that Christians need to be aware that, um, okay, so uh, again, they just have to be aware of that distinction. Craig does argue that Adam must be a historical person. Um, but again, the Bible's not. So what do you guys make of that distinction though? Uh, what do you guys make of the distinction between the textual versus historical Adam, at least as Craig does it? Is is that a legitimate distinction uh, or is it not legitimate at all? Uh, or does Craig take that distinction too far? Well, as, as I said at the outset, I think I think we wouldn't have the discussion at all if Paul did not talk about first and second Adam. Uh, I think, I, I, I think Craig would give the whole thing up if there were not for that unfortunate textual reference to Adam. And uh, I think to make that kind of a distinction is, is incredibly dangerous for where it takes us. I, I, I think it takes us to essentially Andy Stanley unhitching the Old Testament from the New. Uh, mm -hmm. We just, we don't need it anymore. And so I, I, I understand what he's attempting to say, 
that that how this person is used theologically it, it, it's valuable to think in two categories there i understand that but it seems to me that in in essence he basically says what we're told about adam in genesis 1 to 11 is uh, essentially unnecessary mm. yeah yeah one of the you know as you look at craig's summary of what he thinks genesis actually does teach um, he has a list of a dozen or so things that he thinks it teaches actually I, i'm looking at it now it's 10 a list of 10 things he says i read here what are then some of the central truths expressed in the primeval history which of course he labels mytho history the following come to mind and one god is uh, god is one he's personal he's transcendent and so on and, and he lists not in others um, and the transcendence of god of course is is what is emphasized in the in the first pericope that is the first story uh, of genesis one and of course he goes a little bit into chapter two uh, and in the second story um, in Genesis 2, um, he says, well, there appears to be a contradiction because of all the anthropomorphic references and uh, ways of expressing God, uh, because he's um, walking in the garden and he's putting clothes on Adam and Eve after the fall and, and so on. Uh, and he says, and the editor of Genesis doesn't seem to be concerned with these, these, these contradictions because it's a myth. I wonder why not? which shows that you have to interpret it metaphorically. But but look, one of the other, even even Bill Arnold, who um, also uses the term myth of history, makes the point that the second story does emphasize God's eminence. Um, and God, both the transcendence of God and the eminence of God are important. And for some reason, the eminence of God doesn't make Craig's list for um, the teachings of Genesis 1 to 11, which I find very odd because there are other Old Testament scholars, including those who even use the myth of history term. Uh, uh, John's colleague there, uh, Bill Arnold, I uh, think um, acknowledges that there are more, that there are the more eminent aspects, uh, the more eminent uh, nature of God, that he, he wants to be with us and that there, there's good evidence for a, um, for the appearance of God in bodily form um, in Genesis 2, like he did with uh, Abraham in Genesis 18. Um, and yes, Craig yes. Wants, to, wants to resist this. And John, I find it very odd that Craig accepts that God appeared in a temporary uh, human body in Genesis 18, but did says that to, to think that he did so in Genesis 2 and 3 would be it's fantastic. Uh, a pagan myth. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I I I thought about that as soon as I read him saying that. Well, this is this is fantastical. Uh, well, yeah, it's fantastical in Genesis eighteen too. So is that a myth? And uh, one of the things that I have tried to emphasize is that the the Bible will not separate theology from history and when we when we make genesis 1 to 11 we have done that we have intuited theology and created a vehicle by which to express that that's myth and that's not what the bible does mm -hmm. the bible yeah. continually yeah. derives theology from god's activity in history and yeah, if we yeah. say no in Genesis one to eleven, he did it a different way, but we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah, and of course the technical term for this temporary appearance of God in the human form is theophany, and it's a, it's a sure. well studied subject in in theology, and, and you find great evidence for theophany throughout the Old Testament. Um, yes, it's just really weird why why he resists this, and in my review that I'm writing of Craig's book, I, I make a case for. Theophany, in, in, in particular in Genesis 3. Um, but I, it's just, I think, again, it shows that because of this one dimensional mythohistory genre approach, it's really not in sync with more contemporary 
methods like that Jack Collins brings to light in reading Genesis yeah. as well. So it's not like we're against contemporary methods of, of hermeneutics. I think in some ways Craig is behind the times because he, he <laughs> cites Collins. And in Collins, uh, as a constant gentleman, actually endorses Craig's book. And of course, there's a lot of good things that occur in Craig's book. But where they disagree is this uh, Collins thinks that there needs to be analysis along multiple axes of language use. It, yeah. Their language, even in, in uh, historical narratives, language can range from from the more poetic end to the less poetic. Uh, and, yep. and these kinds of subtleties, it requires a lot of hard work. And I think that Craig is just trying to make an end run around all that. And it, it, it's just, um, I think that Craig's scientific analysis is, is very much up to date in regard to the timing of Adam. Uh, but of course, it assumes the, the consensus view. I think he's out of sync with contemporary criticisms that Casey Buskin brought out in the other interview. But I, so, you know, Craig is a very accomplished scholar in multiple fields. Um, but I think in this case, there are certain aspects of his argument that are not uh, it, well attested by uh, other experts, such as uh, uh, Gordon Wenham and uh, Jack Collins. In, in yeah. the details, there, there's some overlap and there's some agreement, but, but it's the devil's in the details here. And I think that's where the myth of history approach uh, really falters. Yeah, no, I like, I think, Mike, I like the, the emphasis you, you brought up, you know, that sort of like Craig, Craig's myth of history is sort of a one-dimensional approach as opposed to a multi-dimensional approach and how we, we understand the text and some of the different elements to that. And I think that's, that's helpful, I, I, you know, visually to think, okay, I, I see that it's sort of like this sort of flat approach that needs to be able to have a little more um, responsiveness to the context as opposed to a uh, predetermined this is the genre therefore let me reinterpret everything within that framework but but that word fantastical comes up and i can't get away you know at least maybe one question related to that so i'm going to go back to that interview with melissa kane travis craig says that the term fantastical is a technical term uh, which means <laughs> that events if taken literally must be understood as what he says quote unquote palpably false now, interestingly, I, I found that word palpable interesting because um, according to the dictionary, palpable means, quote, of a feeling or atmosphere so intense as to seem almost tangible. So for Craig, fantastical is a technical term that means anything which does not feel real to him cannot be historical. You know, I, I just mm – -hmm. And, and it's odd because, like you guys said, uh, you know, God appears in the garden, therefore that's fantastical. But when God has theophanies later, outside of Genesis 1 through 11, for Craig, that's historical. Um, he talks, you know, he, he makes fun of anybody that would believe in a talking snake. That's too fantastical. Yet Balaam's donkey speaks in outside of Genesis 1 through 11. But I'm assuming he, he accepts that as, as, as historical. Because uh, it's not myth. Because it's not myth of history. He he uh, ridicules. I think, and, and I use that word. I mean, I think he really does ridicule in the. And I've seen him in interviews of this, sort of laughing at anybody who would believe in a magic tree, uh, which I don't know where he comes mm -hmm. with the word magic to describe it, except as a pejorative. Um, you know, in the garden, this magic tree. But I, you know, I also cannot think, and I, I've just been mulling this one over. Um, you know, how much of the dietary laws in, you know, food was always related to God's commands and his desires. There's nothing magical about not eating hoofed animals, but yet he said, don't do it. Um, so it's saying that there might yeah. be a, a dietary restriction doesn't seem very fantastical considering the, the overall context. I don't know. I, 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 I've been thinking about that, trying to flush yeah. that out in my head, but, um, right. but let me go let me go to yeah. at, okay jump in there and then i want to go to at some of his what he said in this interview about yeah. the you know this thing but any thoughts from there yeah jack collins argues that the tree of life had a sacramental role and mm -hmm. there wasn't anything magical about the fruit itself but that kind of like yeah. when we take communion it's a, it's a symbol of our right relationship with God and our participation in the work of Jesus Christ. Precisely. Um, Precisely. Yeah. So I think that the sacramental role, in, in, again, Craig has this kind of um, two extremes. On the one hand, he, 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 he uses that in some ways kind of a hyper-literalist interpretive uh, approach to say, look, a talking snake and magical trees and so on, therefore, 
um, you know, you have to go to the other extreme of, of complete metaphor. And I think there, there could have been an actual physical tree that Adam and Eve ate that was called the tree of life that had its sacramental significance, kind of like when we take mm -hmm. communion. That's Jack Collins' view. And the curious thing is, is even though um, that Craig does go run through some of the other alternatives to how to understand Genesis that I think have problems, uh, uh, and and I agree with many of his analyses, but 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 the the ones that I think really have the most traction here, that, such as the ones I just mentioned of Collins, he doesn't discuss. So even though many of the scenarios for for interpreting Genesis have been shown to be problematic, and I think correctly so in in Craig's book, it's frustrating because I, I want I want him to take the next step and look at some of the more recent explanations that show you don't have to go to mytho history there are textually coherent and plausible explanations so you don't have to wildly swing between kind of a, a hyper literalist approach and then a hyper metaphorical approach and that's yeah. i think what craig is essentially doing even though of yeah. course he wants to say that it's 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 different than that but that's kind of what it amounts to yeah uh, there's also there's also the ethical understanding of the tree the issue is, are humans going to submit to God? And the, here it is. And, and the whole interpretation, if you eat this, you will be like God. Uh-huh. If you eat this, you will have refused to submit to God, and you will have put yourself in God's place as the one who knows everything about creation value, good, and knows everything about creation disvalue, evil. And there's nothing magical there at all. It is yeah, exactly. me saying, I refuse to submit to God. I will be God in my life. I think that's profound, and I don't think there's anything magical about it at all. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I felt like the framing is a bit uh, dishonest on Craig. And it, I, I was really shocked, to be honest. Leroy and I have talked about this before, right, Leroy? Oh, it's okay, never. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> nod your head, but, Leroy. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but we've talked about this before. It just seems so unlike what we'd come to expect from a yes a scholarly, yes. Yes. you know, being generous to your opponent as you treat their viewpoint. He seems to have abandoned that in this sort of this sort of approach, and it just it's very shocking. Um, it's, it's very jarring. To those of us it who is. have it is. spent years reading Craig's works and respecting his scholarship in so many areas, but then to see him essentially create a false dichotomy between these two choices and then sort of mock anybody who doesn't hold his view or would would and, and it just I don't know it's just it's just hard to take um, from him. You know, you expect it from you know different people on the internet, but not from how Craig has historically <laughs> dealt with these things. So that's, I don't know, it's just tough. It's tough for us to, for people that have respected him for so long to kind of be in that position to see this. Um, now it is, let me give you one more example and I want to get you guys take on this. Um, so in that interview, like I said, with Melissa Kane Travis, he gives some very specifics of, he gives an analogy, what this fantastical elements of the, what it's like in these other ancient Near East myths. He specifically says, he, he specifically says the myth of the constellation Taurus, uh, it comes down to earth and he's killed in, this is in the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? So Taurus comes out of the sky comes down to earth in, in, as a part of this myth, and uh, he's killed by Gilgamesh. And the flesh of this cosmic bull is used to feed the townspeople. Now, Craig concludes in his interview, he says that, that this fantastical story of Taurus feels the, feels the same to him as the magical tree of knowledge of good and evil, and just as fantastical as God walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. And Craig concludes, quote, even the author of the Pentateuch would have known that these elements, if taken literally, would be so extraordinary as to be palpably false. So, um, so uh. Craig determines, based on uh. you know thousands of years of separation, that he knows that the author of Mo the Pentateuch, which I assume he thinks is Moses, uh, even Moses, he said, knows that you can't take those things literally because they'd be false if you did it. Um, now, on what basis he makes the conclusion of what Moses' psychological state was, I don't know. But, um, but what do you make of his argument 
again, that Genesis 1 through 11 is just too fantastical. There's too many conflicts that even Moses wouldn't take it, uh, Genesis 1 and 2, as historical elements. Yeah. Well, again, again, I, when you read... I, yeah, go ahead, John. <laughs> again, when you read the myths and, and look at... Are there points where there are meeting points? Yes. But in fact, the reality of the way they treat this kind of thing is markedly different from the very restrained kind of way that the Bible uses it. So that it's, it's once again, it's comparing apples and oranges. Yeah. There's a, a, a Jack Collins has an interesting observation on the Genesis account of the flood, particularly at the end of the flood, where they send out birds, where uh, mm. uh, Noah sends out um, a series of birds to determine the timing of their disembarking from the ark. And he notes that the, given what we know about birds and the way they were used uh, in ancient times and, and as well as today, that the scenario in, in um, Genesis, in the biblical Genesis, is very realistic. Um, yes. Whereas you compare that yes. with um, some of the other uh, alternatives in, in ancient Near East that, that, there are, uh, that are unrealistic to what we really know about birds and, and when, which ones should be sent in which order and so on. And so, and, and also the, the uh, Gord Winnem, uh, some of them makes the point that the, the detail about the timing of different stages of the flood in terms of uh, the numbers, it's all uh, timed by where it is occurring in Noah's life from the 600th birthday on, uh, is very detailed. It doesn't look like it's just a generic sort of flood narrative like you have in other cultures, that there are a lot of details and, and features of the Genesis text regarding the flood that um, the NK is talking about something that, that happened. And I, I, I do agree with Collins that they're, the, the apparent universal language of, of the uh, account of the flood, um, uh, it's, there, there, you can make a case that it might have been a regional flood, not, not a global flood. But besides that, sure. how do you go with global or regional flood? Um, it, it, it looks like it's describing a real historical event and uh, because of the way it's described. And I think- uh, Precisely. You look at, yeah, go ahead, John. The, in, in the myth in Gilgamesh, the, the gods want to destroy everybody, but one of them has a fit of conscience and decides he's going to give one guy a chance. And he tells him, take your reed hut and cover it with pitch and bring animals into it and you talk about fantastic that's fantastic yeah. <laughs> a cubicle reed hut covered with pitch is going to exist in a universal flood to save everybody so that what people yeah. are forced to do is they say well okay the hebrews have taken this myth and made it historical mm -hmm. i'd like to argue the other way Mm -hmm. I'd like to argue there was a historic event, and in order to make it universally applicable, they have mis mythified it. Yeah, it's gone the other way, yeah. and and uh, yeah. so yeah, I'm, I'm on, on the bird thing. Uh, uh, Utnapishtim first sends out a dove, and when it doesn't come back, he sends out a buzzard, and when the buzzard doesn't come back, then he says, "Okay, it's okay to get out." Well, that's exactly wrong. <laughs> the Bible's got it right. If the buzzard yeah. doesn't come back, well, maybe it has found carrion to land upon, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that there's dry land out there. You got to send yeah. a dove if you're going to find out if there's dry land. So, yeah. 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 And, and John, Jack Collins also agrees with you, not only on that, but also the dimensions of the ark. Uh, in the yes. Bible. Yes. You know, it's very, very feasible for something that would actually float in, exactly. in, a, in, a, in a very large exactly. cataclysm, whereas exactly. the other ones aren't. Yeah. No, yeah. no. The other thing was not seaworthy at all. Uh, but, yeah. but this is. Let, let me say one other thing in, in this whole thing. How about God 
coming to earth through a virgin's womb and walking on the earth. If that isn't fantastical, I don't know what is. Yeah. I, I think and that's dying where, for the sins of the whole world. Yeah. I, I think that's where Craig is. He's really, he's, he's convinced that you can only apply this to Genesis 1 through 11. That's why he's very clear. You can only do it. But yep. I think other yep. scholars have said, hey, it applies to all the Bible. Uh, you know, he's sure. just trying to say, no, yeah. I want to take, I want to take what they've done and just say only, only constrain it to one through 11. The problem is yes. I think those scholars that try to apply that uh, idea to the whole Bible are more consistent. I think what you end up with Craig is very inconsistent and subjective application of a particular so. hermeneutical method. Um, and, and I think it's, it doesn't hold up. If you're going to accept his mytho hermeneutic, I think you ultimately have to not break it at Genesis 1 through 11. You have to say, okay, it applies to, to the whole scope of the scripture. I think to be consistent. Um, yep. So I think he's, he's, it creates a problem, I guess. And, and that's, let's close with this question then. Um, you know, I, I think that is a problem uh, that the Christians will have to do, but uh, will have to face as they're trying to wrestle with this. I do think Christians should probably read this because even if you are not interested, your pastors are going to be, this book will be a textbook <laughs> in seminary classes. This book will be used by many people to educate them. So it's relevant to uh, what's going to be taught in our churches in the coming years. It really is. So people need to be aware of it. Um so that said, what what do you think, you know, just in final quote, do you think Craig's book is a net benefit to the intended audience? Uh, or or how would you how would you frame that in terms of what people should how they should get out of this? What's the good? Can they can they chew out the good, you know, chew up, get the meat and spit out the bones kind of thing? Or um, what what should people kind of how should they approach this? Yeah, well, I think that Craig's book is best read alongside Jack Collins' book, Reading Genesis Well. And uh, that's kind of the point that I've been developing in my review of, of Craig's book. Um, but Craig's, Craig's book does get a lot of this, a lot of the details right when it comes to the biblical view of the rakia, the, the, the expanse. Uh, it's, it was never meant to be um, a literal physical dome. It's just uh, an expanse. It's a phenomenological term, uh, kind of like sunrise and sunset are mm -hmm. used in the Bible without air, just like modern science today will talk about a sunrise and a sunset, and there's no air there, right? It would be, it would ruin the romantic moment if the scientist said to the spouse, look at the beautiful earth turn, right? Yeah. Uh, so we, we use phenomenological language today. The Bible uses it, and the Bible is without air. So Craig actually gets a lot of that right. And I'm grateful because I've been teaching that for a quarter century to college students uh, in seminaries and various uh, Christian colleges. But um, and he also uh, does critique many of the attempts to harmonize to, to show that there are plausible interpretations of the Genesis that are uh, that are fantastic. He he, he does show that some of those, many of those, are unsuccessful, uh, including some from John Walton. So I agree with Craig's. Uh, some of, uh, quite a bit of Craig's analysis, but just because many of these scenarios that attempt to show that, that these things in Genesis are, are not fantastic, just because many of these have failed, and Craig is correct in, in, in many of his analyses, it doesn't mean that they've all failed. And ironically, some of the best solutions come from Jack Collins, uh, who was on the panel at ETS, um, and he's again, Collins is a consummate gentleman. He, he he's very he you know he wants to point out what Craig got right, and, and Craig got a lot of this right. But um, um, in my review, I'm showing how Collins' own work shows that um, a lot of what that there's important details that Craig got wrong. That uh, that that, uh, that it's going to be very difficult for just the ordinary Christian to tease this all out. Mm. Which is back to your question, yeah. so, and I think that um, we're gonna, it's just going to need to be more uh, more resources published to make uh, to help uh, our fellow believers wade through this and and come out uh, with knowing what they should believe and, and the good reasons for those beliefs. From you, John. Second the motion. 
<laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you second the motion. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that. So, uh, Leroy, final thoughts from you. <laughs> thought so. Um, <laughs> this is uh, all right. I'm, I'm sorry, folks, that uh, Leroy's had a rough technology day, but uh, at least you got to see his smiling face. So, uh, brother, uh, we're, we are the poor for not having you a part of this conversation. Um, and and I wish we would have had your insights as well, because I know a lot of the you put a lot of research into this as well and it's worth getting out there um it just won't happen today but i appreciate that brother and just at least hanging in and filling up the little square there so uh <laughs> um and and mike john i appreciate you guys uh your willingness to come on Thank chat you. about this uh i know that uh it's 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 an important conversation i i hope people will will take the time listen and, and to unpack this um you know and and be as um, open to hearing the critique as they are and to reading Craig, uh, his, his initial work. So hope that goes well. So anyway, thank you all folks. This will be, uh, yeah, I, uh, this, this will be up on our site, more than cake.org forward slash off the cuff and on the YouTube channel uh, as well. So you can check it out there, all our social media things, and we'll have more follow up sometime of this down the road. We're going to take a break from Craig for a while. Uh, <laughs> on our show, I've done enough stuff on Greg the last of a lifetime, but um, we'll we'll get back to some other things down the road. But anyway, take care. God bless you guys. <laughs>